Hello, everyone. We're going to give it just one more minute before we get started, get a few more people logged in. Okay, looks like um, we have most of our callers on. We're just a little after three, so let's go ahead and we'll get started. First, welcome to today's webinar covering a very important topic, the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program. Today, we're gonna provide you with some updates to the program, walk you through that forgiveness application portal and help answer any other questions that you might have. Before we begin, there are a few quick items I wanna share with you. Uh, we had a few callers or attendees on this morning's call who had issues listening through their computers. So we'd like to point out that you can also call in using your phone instead. The number is shown on the screen right now. So hopefully those attendees, if they are, are having those issues, um, they can see this and, and call in. Also, I'd like to inform you that your phones have been muted. However, for extra assurance, we ask that you mute your phones on your end as well. You can ask questions at any time during the webinar by simply toggling down the arrow icon next to the questions box on the right. So from there, you are able, you are able to type in your question, then hit send. We will be pausing throughout the webinar to read and answer your questions. And uh, we had quite a few this morning, so I'm sure um, we'll try and get through those as best we can. Uh, and we might go a little bit over an hour if that's okay with you. Following the webinar, we're going to be publishing a recording it, a recording of it on our website, and this will be located under the COVID-19 Resources for Business page. The link can be accessed on the top menu bar on our website, as shown here. Also on this page, we will publish those questions and answers that we received during the webinar. So be sure to check out our website soon for those extra resources. Now I'll introduce today's presenters. We have Megan Casper, Bank First Chief Credit Officer. Megan will provide an overall update on what we know today regarding the program. Next, we have Kelly Fisher, Bank First Chief Operating Officer. She's gonna take us through the forgiveness application portal and demonstrate the steps that you're gonna to need to take in order to submit your forgiveness application. Kelly will also highlight those additional resources again on our website. And finally, Kyle Von Hayden, he's the Assistant Vice President of Credit at Bank First. He is here to help answer any questions. Kyle has been instrumental in implementing the bank's PPP program and is very knowledgeable on the topic. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Megan for her updates on the program. Megan, are you on? I'm not hearing you. Oh, she just hung up on accident. So hold on <laughs> just a second. She's going to be calling back in. <laughs> I can just jump in, Deb, real quick while sure. we're waiting for Megan to log in. Uh, yep. Hi, everybody. This is uh, Kelly Fisher. Uh, welcome to the webinar this afternoon. We're so grateful that you've taken some time out of your day to spend with us um, related to the PPP program and, and what we've been working on so hard, I think, first for you. Um, as always, we're here for you through this process. Uh, 2020 has been an interesting year, and um, our goal and our main purpose here is to help you through it the best we can. Um, 
it has been very interesting to me to watch the teamwork uh, at Bank First as our main goal is to assist all of our com customers and help you get through a challenging economic cycle. Um, this, it's very interesting to uh, think about the first time in our history that uh, 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 the government will be paying off your loans and, and that's the normal, normal process with these. So it's, it's interesting to think about that and to go through these questions. We do have 1,865 customers who have PPP loans through with us. And so our goal in setting this whole program up was to make it as easy as we can for you uh, to submit what you need to submit to the SBA. Um, and so, uh, Megan, have you joined yet? Have been, you been able to log back in? I am. I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh, don't worry about it. Go for it. You're up. Okay. <laughs> so, yes, just a few updates on the overall PPP process um, and where we are with timing. So the SBA portal is open and they are accepting forgiveness applications. Um, and with that, they have up to 90 days to review the, the applications that they're getting and to provide funds back to the bank to pay off the loan. At this time, the SBA has not reviewed or approved any forgiveness applications to date. Um, primarily, we understand that to be, they're working on ensuring the idle loan loans and that information is, is coming over and connected. Because as you, as we'll probably get some questions on here as we go, you will learn or you will, you already know that if you have a, received an idle advance um, as, as part of proceeds you received, that those dollars will offset um, what you receive in forgiveness. Um, essentially, you've already received that money as a grant from the government, and so that will offset um, what's, what's allowed to be forgiven. So there, the SBA is working on ensuring that information and data is in their system so that it can automatically um, do that calculation. So um, Bank First is ready to submit applications. We, we strongly encourage everyone um, to be thorough in your application and ensure you've used all of your funds and can attest to the requirements of the forgiveness process before submitting. Um, as again, everyone is most likely aware, you, you can choose either an eight or a up to 24 week covered period. So it's either eight or 24 weeks. If you choose the 24 weeks and you have, have completed or, or you're attempting to complete your forgiveness at say 10 weeks, you still are attesting to the fact that you're retaining employees and you're paying those people out to 24 weeks. For that reason, we are very much encouraging people to, if it, if it just is easiest, to wait until that 24-week covered period has ended. It, it will surely make it very clear then that you know, you've, you've used your money, um, you, you haven't made any changes to payroll um, uh, that, that aren't allowed, of course, um, but it, it, should, it should simplify it for you and, and remove what, what we think is a lot of gray. Um, we've, we've heard from, uh, we were just on an SBA call a little earlier, and that seems to be a question that continues to come up. So um, there is no formal deadline to request forgiveness. However, if you have not submitted your application for forgiveness by whichever covered period you choose, so either the eight or 24 week period, plus 10 months, you will be required to begin principal and interest payments thereafter. Um, so we just wanna keep that in mind. Again, no formal deadline, but you would start to pay principal and interest. Um, and then finally, there have been no additional updates to the program um, regarding a shorter or simplified process for loans of 150,000 or less and or other changes to date. We know that there's a lot of, um, at this point, there are really rumors circulating about potential changes that are coming, um, but nothing has been finalized and we have received no additional indication um, of, of any movement on those fronts. If and when that were to happen, um, we would definitely make sure that communication is out to everyone and uh, um, you know, implement those changes as soon as possible. So I will now turn it over to Kelly who will start uh, the forgiveness process through, through our system. Thank you, Megan. All right, uh, now we get into the nitty gritty, everybody. Um, so all of you will, uh, would have received an email from Bank First, and that is where this process starts. That email, I'm gonna show you here. My screen pops up. I'll give it a second here so everybody can see. All right, 
So the email on my screen is what you would have received. A lot of you received the email um, in late July, around July 20th, and the remainder of you would have received it around August 20th. If you do not have your email, um, or if your email looks like mine and it ended up in a black hole or you're just not sure, we'd be more than happy to send you uh, another email. Reach out to your relationship officer at the bank and uh, they will get in touch with us to get this, this out to you. Uh, the email should come from pppforgiveness at bankfirstwi.bank, which you can see up in the top of my screen. Um, that is the email address it should come from. It will also be uh, sent and CC'd to your relationship officer. Your relationship officer will show up uh, in the email, their contact information will also be there for you uh, should you have any questions. When we get into the portal, you will also uh, see their name and contact information throughout the screens uh, in the application process should you have any questions uh, throughout. The email itself is long, and uh, while I do not like long emails, um, uh, this one was long for a reason. Um, it has some uh, important information for you as you head into the process of filling out the application and gives you some tips and tricks um, to uh, take note of when you get in there. Um, it talks about timeline of, of uh, what we know to date. Uh, one thing that has been consistent through this whole process is change. Um, the the um, Congress has changed a few things, SBA has changed a few things, and we are doing everything we can to keep you up to date with the most recent information as we know it. And so you will periodically get emails from us. Uh, some of them will come from this PPP forgiveness from inside the portal and some will come from being first in general. But please keep an eye on your emails because like I said, one thing that's constant about this program is change. Um, and so we want to make sure you understand uh, what we know to date. Uh, so Megan talked a little bit about eight and 24 week covered periods. Uh, we'll, we'll show you that when we get into the application. Um, there is two different applications. There is a straight up 3508, which was the initial application that the SBA came out with. There is um, an updated uh, EZ application, and there is qualifications uh, for the EZ application. The portal, as we get into it, will walk you through step-by-step -step questions to determine whether or not you qualify for the EZ or if you qualify for the standard 3508 application. It is your choice at that point um, to determine, at, once it tells you you do qualify, um, you can use the easy application or you can opt to use the standard. Uh, my recommendation would be if you qualify for an easy, use an easy, but that's totally up to you. Um, as you get into the forgiveness portal, something very important to note that's bolded here, um, Internet Explorer is no longer a Microsoft supported browser. And so as a result, you cannot use Internet Explorer for this forgiveness process. The new uh, supported browser for Microsoft is Edge. So you can use Edge or you can use Google Chrome. So that's important. If you do try to use Internet Explorer, you will immediately see a, a red box that tells you it is not supported. So make sure you're using Google Chrome or Edge as your browser. Um, you will, as we get through the process, you will see the place where you upload required documentation. There is a pretty good list of required documentation that the SBA has indicated we need to collect from all of you. So uh, that is part of the process and I'll show you that when we get in there. Uh, there are several different ways to complete uh, the Schedule A with worksheets and again we will go through that. There is an app, a link to an application guide, and this is on our website. That application guide does have screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions to go through the process. Um, that, I will show you where the link is on our website, but if you prefer to go to the email and grab the link there, it is, it is at the end of that email. 
Now, the most important part of this whole email is way at the bottom, and that is the hyperlink that is unique to each and every customer that uses uh, our forgiveness portal. This is your secure link to get into your forgiveness application. So I am going to copy this hyperlink into my Google Chrome browser, and we'll get in there. So when you uh, go into your browser and paste that hyperlink in, this is the page you will see. Um, it's on the Bank First website, but this is our specific, your specific customer portal to get into the application. Everything that you upload into this portal is in a secure connection. No need to worry about anything uh, getting into the wrong hands. It is all a secure portal. So I'm going to click on, at this point, start the PPP forgiveness process. All of you, um, when we set all of these up, we have a main contact for each business. And that main contact has an email address registered as well as a cell phone number. It is important that it is a cell phone number because the authentication protocol for this website uh, has you put in the last digits of that um, registered cell phone number, and it will send you a six-digit code to log in. This is authenticating you as the individual that we expect to be logging into the forgiveness portal uh, for your instance of the program. The first time that you log in, uh, it will ask you if the cell phone number that is registered is the appropriate cell phone number for you. Uh, if it is not for some reason and you need to change the cell phone number, there's a few pieces of information that you will need to fill in so it can authenticate you as the appropriate customer and then you can change the cell phone number. So that um, the first time you log in, you will notice that. I do see one question here, Kyle, that I'm going to snag quick. Uh, is it 24 weeks from the date it was funded? Uh, yes, that is the short answer to that question is yes. Your covered period starts on the day that you received funds. So that note date, original note date, is uh, that first date of your covered period. Okay, so the first page of the portal is the instructions page. Uh, at the top of the page, you will see your relationship officer and their contact information. Like I mentioned, you will see this throughout um, in different areas in the application process. There is a lot of detail that the SBA has put out. Um, the, they, they do have links to fillable applications on this instruction page that you can click on if for some reason you would like to go and look at the application. If some of you have an application filled out, it is a good resource for you to have on hand as you fill out the information in this portal. Something that is really important for all of you is at the bottom of the screen here. This is an authorized users section. So we have that initial contact or the main signing customer that we would have had on the original application registered as your initial authorized user. If you have uh, an accountant, a CPA firm, a payroll company, other folks uh, in your company that are going to help you fill out the application, you need to add them as authorized users. Uh, at the bank, we can set your initial um, signing user, that first authorized user, but we cannot add additional. Um, as part of the SBA has made very clear that the responsibility and the um, uh, of the accuracy and completeness of the application is the responsibility of the customer. So we're giving you the option here to add whoever is going to help you with the application, and this is the place to do it. So if I have an accountant that's helping me out, I would click on the word new here, which is a hyperlink. It opens up the box for me to put that person's information in, their full name, what company are they with, uh, their email address, and again, their cell phone number. We need that cell phone number to authenticate them. So that would then register them as an acceptable user into your forgiveness portal. After you, after you enter the information and click on the word update here, 
you can forward them the email with the hyperlink and then they will be able to log in as themselves. Another note as you go through this process and when you start filling things in, which happens on the next page, you can save and leave and come back. Uh, you can save at any point and come back later um, should you get interrupted or should somebody else need to log in at that point to uh, fill in some of the information they might have. You can pick up where they left off. Uh, it is very easy to do that. I'm going to pause here because I see we might have a couple of, of questions that have come in. Kyle, do we have a couple questions? Sure. Um, a few on the technical side here uh, with, with the portal. Um, are, is someone able to use Safari as a web browser? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I believe you can use Safari. I've actually not had anyone try it, but uh, I don't know any reason why you would not be able to. The only thing I know you cannot use is Internet Explorer. So give it a shot. Okay. If you do not have a cell number and you access the link and it asks more questions, uh, where do you find the document numbers that are required to access the portal? So one of the things is the loan number. Um, if you do not know your PPP forgiveness loan number or PPP loan number, uh, re reach out to your relationship officer and they can easily get that for you. Okay. And the, uh, the last question so far is regarding the alternative covered period and I believe we'll cover that on our next page. Okay, great. Thank you for your questions. Keep them coming guys. All right, so here's our next screen. As you can see at the top, these are, the, these are the, the separate steps or the different screens in the forgiveness process. So we are now on the second section here or application based basics. You can toggle around in here if you need to go back. It's as easy as clicking up here or I can click down at the bottom. There is a back previous button here. Um, easy enough to move around in the application should you need to. Again, at the top of this page, you'll see your relationship officer's name and uh, contact information. This next section here is customer information from the PPP application. Anything that is grayed out, uh, the fields that are grayed out, are defaulted from the information that the bank has input for you uh, from the application process. If anything in the gray box is incorrect and any of these gray boxes is incorrect, please reach out to your relationship officer as we need to change that on our end. You are unable to change it on your end by just clicking in these boxes. You'll see my red circle there. I'm not able to click in and do anything in those boxes. Everywhere where you see a blue question mark um, is, is a little help thing. So all of these fields, if you hover over the blue question mark, It'll give you a little detail of what should be filled into that particular field. Anything that has a maroon asterisk or this red asterisk here is a required field to be filled in. Even if you have a zero, uh, zero dollar, and it's a required field, you have to type in zero uh, in order to, to move to the next screen. Uh, if you, for some reason, do not fill something in that is required and you try to move to the next screen, at the very top of the screen, you will have a red box that tells you um, particularly what is missing um, in order for you to advance the screen. This next section here um, I, is the customer information from the PPP loan. So this is the information that we have in our core system for the particular loan that you took out. So the loan number is here, the dollar amount is here, and here's your disbursement date that we've talked about. So this is the beginning of your covered period uh, that will default for you uh, based on the original note date from the system. So I just see a, a comment here from a customer. Thank you for submitting this. Uh, they are using Firefox and that is, that is working. So that is another browser that you could use uh, to get into the application. Okay, next section here, customer information needed for forgiveness. Here you've got some white boxes. So here is where you guys come in to start filling things in. 
uh, number of employees at the time of loan application. So this is the beginning of your process. When you filled out that application, how many employees did you have at that point? And then here is how many employees do you have now that you are filling out your application? Uh, here is where you would put if you had an EIDL advance. This is a separate program from SBA that is direct to SBA. Uh, it could have been up to $10,000 advance. Uh, you would know if you have one of these. And if you do have one of these, it will be taken out of the forgiveness amount. So um, the SBA is considering them to be uh, uh, separate programs, but if you have one, it takes out of the other. So um, that is a note for all of you that potentially had an EIDL advance or EIDL advance, which stands for Economic Injury Disaster Loan through the SBA. Then uh, down here, you'll see the payroll schedule. This is a drop down, and so uh, there are several selections which are the most common. If you have other or you have a mix of, of payroll periods for different folks, say your salaried folks have a different schedule than your hourly folks, and uh, there could be mixes like that. If that is the case, you would select other, and then you would put a description uh, over here of what that other might mean. And I just threw in a weekly, biweekly, uh, example for you so you could see that. Uh, this next section here, check this box, if the borrower received PPP loans in excess of $2 million. So the SBA has announced that they will be auditing uh, all PPP loans that are over $2 million. So that is why um, this is a required box to check if your loan is over $2 million. If your loan is under $2 million, um, there will be, from what we understand, a sample audit on those smaller loans. Um, it's very important as a result of that, that everything is, the I's are dotted, T's are crossed, documentation is kept. Uh, they are requiring the banks to keep the documentation uh, related to this program for six years. And that is also the requirement for the customers to hang on your documentation should you ever need need it for an audit or any sort of follow-up that is required. The next section here is covered and alternative covered period information. The very first thing is to select if you are using an eight-week covered period or a 24-week covered period. Um, you have to select even if you, like Megan mentioned earlier, if you do use up your funds, prior to somewhere between eight and 24 weeks, so let's say I use them in 12 weeks, you would want to select the 24 week option. And like she mentioned, you will not wanna finish this out until that 24 weeks is up just because of the requirement on the payroll side of things. So for payrolls, it's important that to note that the full covered period, um, if you reduce your payroll by more than 25%, uh, that is where we could potentially have an issue. So it's best to wait for the full 24 weeks if you uh, feel you have used your payroll in between here. I'm just gonna leave it at 24 weeks. Uh, it will default your covered period start date as that loan disbursement date that we just had up here. So it will default that. You cannot change that. However, you can use an alternative payroll, co payroll covered period start date. Um, and there is a bunch of, look at this, boy, wow. SBA is wordy. So um, the, the information um, summarized is if you have a, a payroll schedule that is, you know, didn't start on this particular date um, and you want to change this date, uh, Kyle, do you want to jump in here? Is it up to a month? that you can change this? The alternative the alternative payroll period? Yeah, yep. I think the preference is you go either backwards or forward one payroll period. So one if, you payroll. Run a weekly, yep. if you run a weekly payroll, you should just go back to either the most recent or the next payroll period. If you have a monthly payroll, you could go back to the beginning of that month or go to the next month. But I try to keep it to just the most recent or the next payroll period. Thanks, Kyle. 
So then when you, if you do need to use the alternative payroll covered period, then it will automatically calculate, again, based on your selection up top here, the eight or 24 week covered period, it will calculate based on the date that you put in that alternative date. Okay, one more section here I wanna talk about quickly before we get, there's, I see there's a few questions in here. So um, the eligibility for the EZ application. There, this is a dynamic um, section of the application process, and it has built-in questions to determine if you do qualify. Uh, the first question is, uh, you are a self-employed individual, you're an independent contractor, or you are a sole proprietor who had no employees at the time of the application and did not include any employee salaries in the computation of average monthly payroll in the initial application. If you say yes to that question, you automatically qualify to use the EZ should you so choose. Uh, that's why there's this question here. You are eligible, do you want to? Um, it's an option for you to use it. Uh, again, if I can use something that says easy, I'm, I'm gonna use it easy. Um, so I'm gonna then show you what happens if you say no. If you say no to that, you get a couple of more questions that pop up. Uh, and these, are, this is, these two are and, so they both have to be a yes in order for you to automatically qualify at this point. And it talks about reduction in annual salary or hourly wages, uh, by that, you know, more than that 25% amount, or you didn't uh, reduce the number of employees or average paid hours of employees between these specific dates. So if I were to say yes to both of those, I qualify. And so then you'll see this qualification again comes up. If I were to say no to either one of them, I would then get one more set of questions. And uh, again, it these are very wordy, so I'm not gonna read them to you, um, but make sure you read them in detail so that you understand uh, what they mean. If I were to say yes, again, to both of these, then I, again, qualify for the easy. So they tried to have different scenarios that get you to qualify for the easy application, um, and you just have to answer those questions and it will automatically bring you the information you need. One more thing, Kyle, and then we'll get to your questions here. Okay, at the very bottom of the screen, um, we have demographic information. That is, this is not a required area. You do not have to put anything in here. Uh, the SBA has asked that we ask our customers this information, but like I said, you definitely do not, it's not required to fill in. Okay, Kyle, at this point, uh, I see you've got a few questions. Do you wanna hit them up? Sure, yeah, we have some, right. some very good questions here, especially as it's pertaining to employee count. So I'm gonna try to go through these um, in the best way possible. Um, on this screen that we're looking at, you know, it's asking for your employees at uh, time of application and then time of forgiveness. Uh, what, what's key here um, when looking at this page and how you're filling out your application is you want to be consistent to what you did at application. So at the time of application, and you counted some part-time, you, you totaled your part-time and full-time into that figure. Do that again when it asks for your number of employees at time of forgiveness application. If you did a full-time employee equivalent number at application, you want to do it again here. Now later when we calculate that FTE count for your forgiveness calculation, you will have to do an actual FTE calculation. And there's a couple different ways to do that. Uh, one is called the simplified method, and it's you count any full-time employee, which is typically measured as a 40-hour week employee on average. Um, you count them as one full employee, and any part-time employee, no matter how many hours, you count as a half. That's the simplified method. You can do an advanced method, which um, totals up the number of hours worked um, by that part-time employee and, and divide it uh, then by the days worked or that the amount hours worked. So you could do like instead of 0.5, you could end up with like 0.7 if they worked 30 hours or be 0.75 if they worked 30 hours a week. Um, so you're going to want to dive into that and do whatever makes sense to you to help get the best 
FTE equivalent quotient, which is part of your calculation. And we'll go over that here in a few screens. Um, so calculating that FTE count, and in the rules, the SBA does dictate that there is flexibility there. Every business may define an FTE employee a little differently, um, but what key is is that you provide that documentation to us and we provide that to the SBA as part of your file of where those numbers come from. Um, I hope that helps. The full-time equivalent is probably one of the most complicated parts of this process. So, um, you know, work with your payroll provider if you have one, um, an accountant, if he, helps you with pay, he or she helps you with payroll. Um, if not, we can, we can definitely try to help you out if you have some questions on that. Reach out to your relationship manager um, and or us directly and we can try to help you out. Um, a good question here is if, we, if you had to let go or fire an employee because of performance uh, during this covered period, which then affected your full-time employee count, Will your loan, will your forgiveness of your loan be denied? Uh, it will not. Um, there are safe harbor clauses, they're called, within this application where all you would need to do is put a note in your file describing the situation and why this employee was let go for cause. And if you use that in your supporting documents, you can um, avoid having that penalty of reducing your employee count. That's a very good question. Um, not just for firing for performance if an employee if you offered employment back and they decided not to take that employment, as long as you prove that you offered employment to that employee, that does not harm your forgiveness application as well. Um, and I think there's a few, another question that just came in regarding that. So it really goes back to, again, if you terminate employee for cause um, or you offer employment back and they decide not to take it, just add some proof to the file of the situations. Um, it can be a pretty simple paragraph note of what happened in case SBA asks and you are not penalized for those situations. Um, one more question, just continuing to go along the lines of the FTE calculation method. Um, the question is, does that calculation method for forgiveness have to be the same calculation method used at time of application? Um, it should um, for consistency purposes. Now, if for some reason it, it, your calculation changed and you believe it is beneficial to you and it doesn't essentially fraud anybody, you're not making a, a crazy calculation just to help your forgiveness, that's totally fine. You know, it may just be, a, again, a note to your file, add it to your supporting documents. Here's our FTE calculation and why it may be different than what we did at origination. And that is the questions I have at this point. All right, Kyle, thank you very much. Keep keep coming with the questions, that's, that's great. I like that we're interactive and uh, that's what we're here for. So, okay, I'm going to move on to the next screen. So at the bottom here, I've got two buttons. I have a save and I have a save and continue. Uh, because I'm gonna continue moving through the application, I'm gonna say save and continue. If I were to just be, I, I'm gonna save and I'm gonna move on to something else and come back to this, or now it's time for my accountant to step in, so I'm gonna save and exit. Uh, you can do that by clicking save and then exit log out and it will keep everything that you've entered to this point. I'm gonna click on save and continue. And here is my next screen. This is the worksheet screen. And if you remember, I said that I do not want to do the easy application, just because I want to show you guys the additional screens that are here um, and the options that are here if you do not qualify for easy. Um, these two sections, the worksheets and Schedule A, will be gone if you do choose the easy application. So if I go back and I say, okay, I, I'm go I know I qualify, I'd like to use it, and I click on save and continue, you will notice that the steps have gotten less. Those two pieces have come out, which of course makes the time that you have to spend in into this process less. So that's, that's always a good thing. So if you do not qualify for easy, or if you choose not to, then your screens will look like this one here. So those options came back here as steps in my process. This section is the worksheet section. Um, this is what helps you fill out Schedule A. Um, uh, frankly, I think by far the most complicated piece of, of completing the uh, forgiveness application. 
we do have several options for you to complete your Schedule A worksheet. You can select using the wizard, um, which if you um, don't have anything prior is probably your best option. Um, if you do have your own worksheet that either you put together or you have an accountant that did for you, you can select the second option and this window pops up where you can upload the files. You have two options to upload. They need to be either a PDF or an Excel document. Uh, you can browse to your hard drive or your network to grab the files or if you have a control panel open and you wanna just click and drag them into this open area, you can do that as well. The choice is yours there. If you um, really or you really have a desire to fill out a calculator and you do not have uh, one at your disposal, you can use, uh, we created one out here called the Bank First Loan Forgiveness Estimator. If you click on that, that will open an Excel document. You can save that off uh, after completion and then you can upload it here as well. Just because you fill out a worksheet doesn't mean that you don't have to then fill in the information in the appropriate areas in the portal, but it will help you to know the numbers to fill in. It will calculate what you need to fill into those spaces on the portal. I'm gonna select the build using wizard option so you can see that. As Kyle mentioned in the question and answer period, there are two different uh, FTE calculation um, options. The simplified method, which you know the full-time person is get, is assigned a one and the part-time is assigned a 0.5, or normal calculations, which are based on average hours. So uh, you can use either method. The choice is yours, and and this is where you would select that option. The first section of this wizard worksheet is for owner compensation. This is owner compensation only. You would click on this add word right here, which is a hyperlink to bring you into the worksheet for owner compensation. It gives you a description of what goes into this worksheet. Um, it, there's descriptions all over in here because it is, it is um, uh, always changing. And so make sure you're reading and understanding the nuances related to payroll and what is uh, included and what is not. Um, owner name, uh, you know, SSN number, and then here we have compensation in the equivalent period of their applicable compensation in 2019, and then compensation in the covered period for 2020. It will also give you a note here of what your covered period is so that you know which specific dates it's looking for for the compensation numbers. When you are finished with adding your owners into this section, you would click on update and it will then uh, save that into the system. The next section, so this is gray here because it's going to fill in, it's gonna calculate based on your worksheet and the numbers you fill in here, it will automatically put this number in for you. The next section now is employee compensation. So this owner should not be included in this section here. This is employee only. Um, and again, we have more descriptions here of you know folks that made over $100,000 or equal to $100,000 are not included and some things like that. So make sure you're reading those things before filling out these worksheets. Again, the same thing as owner's compensation, you click on add and you include the information in here. Very similar, a uh, few added things that we need on the employee side of things, but uh, very self-explanatory. here. Again, once you complete that uh, particular section on employee compensation, these boxes will fill in for you and calculate the appropriate totals and fill out the Schedule A then uh, in the appropriate boxes. Here is where it talks about the FTE reduction exceptions for employees making less than 100,000 per year. This is important for you to note, as well as the exceptions for employees making more than $100,000 per year. I see some questions popping in, Kyle. Do you want to take a break and take those questions? 
Yeah, definitely. And uh, that last section that Kelly went over there on the bottom where it goes over those fun paragraphs there, um, that's where it covers those instances of maybe an employee was fired for cause, uh, voluntarily resigned, or voluntarily even requested to have reduced hours for whatever case. Um, this line is where you would put in that full-time employee equivalent count of those positions that were affected by those situations. Um, a few questions here um, that have been sent in as well. Um, what if one of the employees is an owner? Um, so if the owner is paid essentially W-2 wages, um, which is allowed, you'd want to enter that under the owner's compensation box. Keep that out of the, the employee's box, um, as, as Kelly showed up top. Uh, nonprofits, a uh, great question regarding nonprofits uh, where there are no owners. Can you skip the owner compensation part? Definitely. Same with even um, companies that have owners who don't take wages. Uh, if you have nothing that's paid to an owner or you don't have any owners, you definitely just skip that section and nothing will be calculated for that section. And it will just uh, take that into account when it summarizes all the, uh, the payroll costs. Good question here. Uh, in the screens where you have to provide information regarding um, employee counts greater than, a, than 100,000, am I able to start but not finish that screen if I don't have all of the information at hand? Uh, definitely. So if any, even, in, even the box that just goes over the employees and not the owner's compensation box, when you're using this wizard tool, uh, as you go in there and you click to add someone, um, you add them, and if you need to go get more information for someone else, you just come back and add them later. Um, so it definitely saves everything you've entered as long as you click save at the bottom of your screen before you exit, and you can come back at any time and add or delete employees as you need to out of those tables. Uh, another good question came in um, regarding um, ownership. Um, what if a, there's a small amount of ownership um, for this example, an owner is 2% owner of the company. Um, where do we put that? If an owner has any sort of percentage ownership in the company, I would advise to put wages they take into the owner's box. Another good question. Does only W-2 income get calculated for owners? What about draws or slash distributions do they need to be counted? Only W-2 income is an allowable expense uh, because that is subject to payroll tax. And this, um, and hopefully on the application side, um, any distributions or draws taken by an owner, unless it's guaranteed payments from a partnership um, or a sole member LLC, but draws distributions not subject to payroll tax are not allowable expenses for the PPP program. And that gets us through our questions at this point. Thank you, Kyle. All right, we will chug along onto the next screen. So now we are on Schedule A. So I, fill, I filled out my worksheets and I didn't fill anything out, but if I would have, you would see uh, information filled into these gray boxes. Again, these are gray, so it will automatically calculate for you. Um, there is nothing you need to fill in in the table one totals or table two totals. It will take information you filled in from the previous page and total it up for you. Um, if you, uh, this next section here, if you had any non-cash compensation payroll costs during the covered period or the alternative payroll covered period, you would fill them in here. Uh, things like employee health insurance, uh, any contributions to that employee health insurance, any contributions to employee retirement plans, uh, and uh, state and local taxes assessed on employee compensation. Those get filled in here in the appropriate line six, seven, and eight of this area. And it, like I said, if you go over the little blue circles, it'll give you a, a description of what it's looking for in those in those particular fields. Okay, um, compensation to owners here. So let's go into the, again, we have a little worksheet here. Uh, so these are amounts paid to owners, uh, owner employees, a self-employed individual or general partners, 
for borrowers using a 24-week covered period, this amount is capped at $20,833 for each individual or the two and a half month equivalent of their applicable compensation in 2019, whichever is lower. If you use the eight-week covered period, the amount is capped at $15,385, uh, the eight-week equivalent of $100,000 per year for each individual or the covered period equivalent of their applicable compensation in 2019, again, whichever is lower. So that is what goes into these areas here. And again, we have some automatic calculations here based on what I put in uh, above. It would calculate this number. I would not need to fill that in. Uh, payroll costs, again, this will automatically calculate, add up what we did above. Uh, it's gonna add the particular lines that it lists here uh, for your total payroll cost. There is a checkbox over to the right here. Um, Two options here, I've had no reductions in employees or average paid hours, or you have a reduction safe harbor uh, one option here as well, which Kyle has talked about a couple of times. Based on what I filled in above, again, it will automatically calculate line 11, line 12, and line 13. Uh, average FTEs during the chosen reference period, total average FTE, and FTE, FTE reduction quotient. Kyle, we have a couple of questions. Do you want me to keep going or do you want to answer those couple things? I think if we could answer these, and if Kelly, if you could yep. go back to our screen where it asks to uh, build a wizard or use a uh, worksheet yep. on your own. Yep, will do. So on this page, using our Schedule A worksheet method, um, we chose the option to build using a, a wizard where we go through and enter in all our employees' information. Um, there's going to be a lot of times where you can just upload your own worksheet. Um, a lot of good instances of this are if you have a, a payroll software or have a company that does payroll for you, um, a lot of these systems are able to just generate reports that you can use to get all of the information you need. Um, you can take that, it's probably an Excel spreadsheet or some document, uh, and upload that instead of typing in all those different names because it's the same information that you've already accomplished. Um, you know, we see that a lot with companies that have a large amount of employees. Um, even if you don't have a Schedule A worksheet out of a payroll provider, you're doing it on your own, uh, you can definitely do that outside of um, this wizard um, that the bank form we provide there called our Bank First Loan Forgiveness Estimator. Feel free to use that Excel template um, to enter in the information and then upload that final version as well. You can take all that information then, and as we go to the next screen, you'll then manually put in the information into the Schedule A uh, based on the information on that sheet instead of putting it into the wizard and automatically um, doing that for you. Um, there was another question regarding line eight on the 3508 form. If, um, if we go to that next page, Kelly, mm -hmm. um, and ask, does that cover payroll taxes? Uh, yes, this is where you would put in your payroll tax amount paid during the covered period. Um, I think we have one other good question here. It's asking if we're going to go through the EZ application. Um, we, we do not plan to go through step by step on the EZ application. So the main difference in the EZ is there's no Schedule A component to it. So if you choose the EZ application, um, the amount of questions you need to answer are, are a lot smaller. And that's why we do emphasize to use that form if you if you can and qualify. Uh, really all it asks for then is um, your payroll costs on line one, um, which you can add um, up above in that box um, for owner's compensation, uh, as Kelly's clicking on now. Um, this would be if you're self-employed uh, or a sole proprietorship, this is where you would add your information. Um, and then, um, that auto calculates into your payroll costs. Uh, it, it's just a lot simplified, more simplified process. You don't need to enter in line by line every single employee you have to go over your, your FTE counts for all those employees, et cetera. So um, a lot more simplified process. Uh, I think the system does a very nice job guiding you through it if you do choose that easy option as Kelly just did there. I think that gets us current on the questions. Great questions so far.
Great. Thank you, Kyle. All right, let me just advance here. Okay. All right. Like I said this morning, this screen has the money shot. So um, as we scroll down on the forgiveness section of the application, um, here is where, uh, so Kyle, when we just uh, did the easy part, it actually brings us right to this section. It changes it a little bit to throw in owner's comp here, um, but this will calculate the total payroll cost on this one. We'll calculate based on what we filled in in the Schedule A in the previous screen. Uh, you would then enter your business mortgage interest payments. You would enter business rent or lease payments. And this is only if you used uh, this money as part of your application uh, to receive the funds. So uh, if you ended up you know, using 100% of your funds in payroll, hey, you're done. You did the payroll part and, and you're set. However, if you did uh, have some a portion of the loan, the 40%, in mortgage interest or rent or lease payments or utility payments, uh, this is where you enter those amounts. Now, these are required fields. So something important to note is they may be blank. And if they're blank and you don't have anything in there, you do have to put in zero. So just note that um, as you go through. If you're not using these fields, you still need to throw a zero in there. Uh, the adjustment for full-time equivalent and salary uh, and hourly wage reductions. This will calculate automatically for you uh, based on the wizard and the answers we had on the previous two screens. Your potential forgiveness amount, and at the bottom is the result calculation. And if this was real and I was doing this, I might have a bit of a heart attack right now as I see my principal to pay <laughs> is $265,000, even more than my original loan. <laughs> So thank goodness this is a test portal and I am not a real PPP customer at this point. So this will give you your original PPP loan amount. It will take out what, what the system is calculating is your forgiveness amount. If you did have an idle advance, it would put that here. And your final principal to pay amount would be included in this last box. If you notice something um, is incorrect, uh, if it is way more than you expected it to be, um, you know, reach out uh, to your relationship manager and, you know, we will help take a look to see uh, what you might be missing or uh, ask you a couple questions to trigger maybe something that you might be missing. Um, but uh, that is that final number. Now, depending on when you submitted your PPP application. The SBA did change the program. Um, I believe it was in early June-ish timeframe, maybe mid-June, um, to a five-year program. So if you are prior to that date, it is a two-year. Uh, if you are after, it is a five-year. You will obviously know that based on the loan that you signed originally. Um, if you do not submit your forgiveness application to us, 10 months after your covered period expiration date. So if you chose the 24 week covered period, you would have to add 10 months to the expiration or the end date of your covered period. If we have not received your application in that time frame, you will start getting billed for principal and interest after that 10th month. So that, that is when um, that would begin if you do not submit an application. So obviously we recommend all of you submit an application. Our goal is to have as much of your funds all uh, forgiven um, and that is what we're expecting to see. So um, I see a bunch of questions flying in here, Kyle. So either I said something wrong or people are thinking of good questions. <laughs> no, nothing wrong. Uh, we're gonna touch base quick on the EIDL. Um, okay. program now yep go for it um i'm not going to say the sba has changed the rules as we've gone i think they've become more clear on how these programs correlate between the ppp and eidl over the course of the last month or so um now the eidl program itself is separate from ppp um, if you've got an eidl loan the actual loan um that is separate and that's got a different repayment. That advance amount, which you could have got up to $10,000 based on your number of employees, is going to be required to be repaid if you also received a PPP loan. Um, the reason for that is the purpose of both of those loans was meant to be for payroll 
and according to SBA guidelines, you can't use both loans for the same purpose. So with that said, and how it pertains to these forgiveness calculations, if you got an advance amount from the EIDL program, they will subtract that off of your final forgiveness amount. Even if you have enough funds to go over your amount due, you're still gonna be required to pay that advance back. Um, and this wasn't very clearly stated up front. I, I, it's now come more understanding, but that advance amount will be needed to be paid back. So how this process will work is we will do the final calculations. Uh, we will send in your forgiveness app to the SBA. Let's say you have enough to get full forgiveness and they agree, but they see you had a $5,000 EIDL advance that you received. They're gonna pay the loan off all the way down to $5,000 and you will be required to pay that back to the bank. Um, the next question received here is, is a good one. Uh, if we spent all of the loan proceeds in 12 weeks, could we fill out the app now and just wait until after the 24th week? The SBA does allow you to, to apply early. Your covered period either is eight weeks or 24. So if you had enough after 12 weeks, you would use a 24 week covered period and you would just use your payroll, for example, through that 12 weeks. Um, that is okay. Um, now what you're attesting to, the caveat to that, is you're attesting that you're keeping your employee count at, up through those full 24 weeks. Um, so our advice would be to probably wait through those 24 weeks if you can, um, so that you can attest that your full-time employee count or whatever your FTE equivalent count is, is truly through that full covered period. Um, because if they do come back and for some reason review your file and you cannot prove that to them, they're gonna take that off your final forgiveness amount. Um, we also, and I know it's it's through that 12 weeks in this example, that's great. Um, and you have that. If it's possible to overdo it and you have enough to use 16, 20 weeks of data to really give you a huge amount showing you have plenty of payroll costs to forgive this loan, that's great too. Um, we really wanna make sure really want to make sure that that's what we are um, getting at here is really show the SBA that you have all these costs covered. Um, our next question is another good one. Uh, if we use 24 weeks, do we get to use 24 weeks of money spent for payroll utilities and rent? Or is it just 24 weeks of payroll and eight weeks of utilities and rent? You get to use all 24 weeks on all those different types of eligible costs. The big rule is you just need 60% of your cost to be from payroll. The other 40% can be made up from all those other um, utilities, lease payments, interest, etc. cetera. Um, another good question here, if Congress approved simplified forgiveness of 150,000, would the EIDL still have to be repaid? Um, I, I can't say for certain on that because we don't know if they will approve that and what the rules would be to that. So I, I don't want to speak too far into that. All I know right now is that if you got an EIDL advance, you will be have to repay that. Um, another good question uh, regarding when we initiated the PPP loan, did we designate if we were using eight or 24 weeks? Uh, you did not. That is something that came out once they uh, made the forgiveness rules. Um, so you can pick your covered period and what you chose at origination has nothing to do with that. Um, I know we have a few other questions here, but I think Kelly, I'll let you proceed and we'll try to um, get those questions before we wrap up. Sounds good. Um, to add to what Kyle is, is mentioning with the 24 week covered period, if you want to go in here and fill out your application, you know, go for it. it the system will save your information. Um, and then if you want to wait and, you know, put a little tickler in your calendar when the 24 weeks expires and then go in and sign it and pass it through on that date, fantastic. Um, if you, you know, it's, we're just recommending that you um, be cognizant of that 24 weeks just because it, it, we certainly don't want it to be an issue for you going forward. So if you feel very confident that I've got everything done and nothing is going to change in my payroll and you want to fill out the application, go ahead. Um, it saves in here. So you're not going to lose anything. 
um, while it's fresh in your mind, you, you know, after the call today and you, and you want to go in and fill things out, that's okay. Um, if you want to wait to sign then for the 24 weeks, because then that gets us all the information and then we submit it for you, that is perfectly okay. Okay, the next screen here that we're looking at is the supporting documentation screen. So based on the answers to the questions throughout the process, you will have a list of documents to submit uh, that we will then uh, keep and either um, have on file if the SBA should need it or submit if it's one of the required documents for us to submit. If it is highlighted red, as you'll see down here in the non-payroll section, these happen to be highlighted red. It is required to advance to the next screen that you upload your information at that point. These are uh, good information and things that we need. Uh, so we are asking that you submit uh, everything that you have. It is nice to have a complete package and to have everything uh, for supporting documentation as we do a review. Um, of your process and we make sure that we have everything that the SBA requires for us to keep uh, throughout this process. Again, same process that I mentioned earlier where you can browse to your local hard drive or to your network to grab the file. It must be a PDF or an Excel document or again if you have your control panel open you can click and drag them into this box anywhere and it will save that in there. If you have, uh, if you upload something and you realize later after you saved it that, oh darn it, I've got to up upload a new one, I have a change or I made a change to the documentation, just upload the new one. We will see on our side, uh, we will see uh, the date that you uploaded and we will use the most current dated documents for each of the different sections. So uh, don't worry about having to delete, you are unable to delete. Now, that being said, if there is something in there and you want us to delete it, you can certainly reach out to your relationship officer and we can get it deleted for you uh, out of the portal. At the bottom of this screen, after you've uploaded your documents, there are two areas for you to click on. Uh, the SBA requires us to have you attest to a few different things here related to the accuracy, um, the accuracy of your application and following all the rules and the guidance that SBA has put out for this process. So that is here, um, as well as the, the bank's responsibility as kind of the middleman um, of the process to help facilitate your forgiveness with the SBA. The actual responsibility of the accuracy of the application is between you as the customer and the SBA. If I was completed with this documentation piece, I would click on save and continue, and that brings me to the very last stage of the forgiveness application process, which is review and sign. It will bring you through a DocuSign process. I'm not gonna do this today uh, because what it does is it actually, as the authorized user for that uh, business, uh, it will ask you out of wallet questions to authenticate you as the appropriate individual to sign the application. And so you would actually see my, my personal out of wallet questions and not that I don't trust any of you, but I've always been told that I shouldn't share that information. So um, I, I won't go to that screen, but it's very simple. You answer the out of wallet questions on yourself and then it brings you into the area where you electronically sign the final application. Once you have clicked in the appropriate boxes and, and assigned the application, it will then give you a hyperlink for you to save off a completed signed uh, 3508 or 3508EZ, depending on which one you used, and you can save that off. Once you are completed with that, you can submit to the bank and your process is complete. We will then receive on our side the information that you submitted and we will do a review of that file. Um, we may reach out to you if uh, we feel something might be missing or we have a question on something. Uh, we, we will probably be doing that uh, in some cases. Uh, once we have completed our review, then we will submit to the SBA. The SBA has 90 days to reply uh, to our submission. Um, and so they will then approve or deny the application 
and then will remit the funds to the bank to pay off the loan. They will pay the interest on the loan through the date that they fund it. So whatever date they send us the funds, they will pay the interest up to that date. I see a couple more questions popped in. Kyle, do you want to address those now? Yeah, sure thing. Okay. Um, one question goes back to our FTE count. And is that count the actual count of FTEs at the at the 24th week, so the end of your covered period, or the average from the funding date? Um, when when we go through the FTE count, um, what is what they're looking for is your average FTE count over your covered period. So it is an average over that covered period compared to the average FTE count from a reference period. Uh, and that reference period can be uh, actually three different time zones. You can go back to your count from February 15th of 2019 to June 30th of 2019 and find what your FTE count was during that time. Uh, you can use the first two months of this year, January 1st through February 29th of 2020. Um, or if you're a seasonal employer, uh, you can use a consecutive 12-week period between May 1st and September 15th of 2019. Essentially, what, you're, what you want to see is that your average FTE count was at least the same as one of those three periods. Um, if it is lower, you may see a reduction in your forgiveness amount um, because you could have had, you may have employed less people than you did before you received these funds. Um, a good question here that we didn't address earlier was, what if we our loan was funded on the day of a payroll? Does that payroll get reflected, or because it was pay periods the two weeks before, should we start with the next payroll date if they have a biweekly payroll? Um, the payroll cost can be either actual payroll paid on dates, or it can be accrued. You have the option of either, as long as you're consistent throughout your payroll period. So in that case, you could count that payroll you paid on that first day of disbursement um, because it was actual paid during your period, or you can wait and just do the next two weeks as an accrued payroll and count the actual paid in those two weeks. Um, a good one here that we haven't seen yet, if you've purchased another company during your forgiveness period and acquired their employees under your payroll, would they count as FTEs for the calculation? I have not seen anything that says you cannot. Um, you, you should be able to. Um, those are employees you're paying and you're using these funds to pay them to keep your business operating and performing. So you should be able to use uh, those employees as your FTE count. Um, Doc, do you need documentation from the three categories you mentioned? I, I assume the three categories, um, I'll just go through the different things. Yes, you, you need documentation for any type of expense that you're including in your forgiveness application, um, all the way from payroll to um, health insurance payments, uh, retirement benefits, payroll tax, if you're including uh, rent, utilities, interest, you need proof of all of those things that you're expensing. So whether that be just a bill from a utility company, uh, if it is a lease, you do need the actual lease agreement in the file, and that lease does need to be in place prior to February 15th of this year. Uh, one thing that's come up is if, if you're an operating company that pays rent to your, basically yourself through a different entity as an owner, um, you do need an actual lease in place in the file. Uh, you cannot, um, you cannot uh, use those expenses if you do not have a, a legal lease in file. Um, a few more here. Um, there was one on here about maybe having a wrong email address when this process started. Uh, if you need a, to ensure your email address has been updated on our system and to make sure you get your most current link, um, please contact your relationship manager. Uh, they'll work with someone here at the bank to make sure we get you the most current link to the correct email address. Um, if, the S, if the SBA denies forgiveness, do you have a chance to fix whatever might be an error or does bank first come back with any errors? Uh, so just to clarify our process, when you do submit your final um, signed application to the bank, we are going to do the best good faith review of your file we can. Uh, if we see some issues in it or have questions as to where some of the figures came from, we will reach out to you directly, either from someone in our SBA department or through your relationship manager. Now, if it's sent to the SBA, 
and they find they want to ask more questions or want to do a review of that file, uh, they will send the bank a message on that, and we have to tell you within five days um, of that message that they are reviewing your file. At that point, the SBA will ask for information. Uh, we will give them whatever you provided to us, and we may reach out to you to get more information if needed um, to help the SBA answer their questions and hopefully um, come to a, a good uh, resolution on that. Um, I had a question here just to quick repeat the dates for averaging FTEs. Um, I'm assuming that's when you look back to that reference period. Um, you can also find these out in our, on our um, resource guide out on our website um, on the instructions page of the, of the PPP application forms. But the three date periods you're looking at for your reference period is, one, you can go from February 15th of 19 through June 30th of 19. You can go from January 1st, 2020 through February 29th of 2020. Or if you're a seasonal employer, you can use a consecutive 12-week period uh, between May 1st of 19 and September 15th of 19. Um, one more question we have here is um, on the worksheet page of the um, software, box one and two are grayed out. How do we enter the amount here? Okay, so that is going to be an amount that is auto computed from what we enter in the box above. So there is where you would click on add. And this is where you're going to enter the employee name um, and all their information. Um, every employee you enter in here is then just is calculated and summed up into box one. Um, and then box two is the full time equivalent employee count um, for everyone you enter. It'll auto calculate the count of those employees. So that is why those are grayed out. Anything you see grayed out means that it's being computed from either our database or through this software, it's being calculated for you. And I think that got us through the questions. Um, I, I do know that we will be summarizing all of our questions we received today. We had two webinars, one this morning and one here this afternoon. We will be looking um, to put together a full document of some of the, the questions that were answered and try to put together good answers for you going forward. Um, that document will be found out on our uh, website with the other resources for the PPP program. Um, hopefully at some point, um, as soon as tomorrow morning, we can get that finalized, get that out there and, and use that for future reference. Thanks, Kyle. I'm just uh, showing on my screen here. You can see this is our Bank First WI.Bank homepage. Um, at the top of the screen here, like Deb mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, there is a section for you uh, to learn more about our COVID-19 resources. And at the top of this is the PPP loan forgiveness section. There is a ton of information in here, uh, very useful to you as you go through the forgiveness process. Uh, we will be uh, taking our recording from this uh, training session and putting it out here so that you can reference that later, as well as uh, we will put together a frequently asked questions document based on the questions and, and answers from today from both our morning session and our afternoon session, and we'll put those out here as well so that you have some additional resources uh, at your disposal should you need them. Um, the sign up to receive PPP email updates from Bank First, if you you know of a customer who has a PPP loan with Bank First and they haven't been receiving any emails, it's either because they've opted out of emails or um, maybe we have an incorrect email address. So have them uh, reach out to their relationship officer so that we can get them um, uh, uh, signed up or have them go to this link on our website and sign up for to receive updated emails. We will be sending you uh, regular communications as we have been, um, as we know more or as things change. Thank you so much for joining today. I'll turn it over to Deb. Great. Well, hopefully that was helpful. I think we covered a lot of information, and uh, there seems to be a lot of moving pieces in the program. So everyone on our team is, is doing our best to keep everything up to date and keep you informed. Um, I guess that's all we have. With that, we thank you for joining, and uh, be safe and have a great day. Thank you, everybody.